Hi everyone, so welcome to video two in this series where we're walking through the application process. So for this video, we really wanted to focus specifically on assembling a school list and what kind of considerations are important in assembling a school list that will set you up for success during this application process. Yeah, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about is how many programs people generally apply to and how to kind of figure out that right number for you. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to say before we kind of get into this, um, and we'll talk about our own personal experience, is that a really common phenomenon with um, deciding to apply to schools is like getting a list of schools, you decide it, you really like them all, you like write your essays, and then you submit your application, and then a little bit of time goes by, and then you panic apply. <laughs> so the first thing that we wanted to say before we got into any of this is don't panic apply to schools, um, <laughs> or at least try to avoid it if you can. Um, especially try not to panic apply like in August or something where it's kind of early. Um, but with that said, um, we think the biggest thing that goes into picking a school list is making sure that you're only applying to schools that you're actually gonna be happy going to. Because at the end of the day, with whatever the cycle brings, it could be that like any one school on your list is the only school that you get into. And if you reject a offer to a school, it's very unlikely that you'll get into other schools in future cycles. So it really means that you should be going to that school if you get an acceptance. So you want to make sure that that's a school that you would actually be happy at and not just the school that you apply to just to shoot out another application or increase your shot of getting into any MD PhD program. Yeah, absolutely. So on the number side, I end up applying to um, 24 schools with two of them being one of those panic applications, which I totally regret sending and the cost of sending those applications to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, for me, I think that I ended up applying to 16 schools before um, panic applying and then I ended up panic applying to four more schools. I also feel the same way. Um, so yes, that brings us back to our original point. Do not panic. <laughs> <laughs> but in general, I think a good number is anywhere between 12 and 20. I'm, I want to give a broad range depending on people's situations, but I think 12 and 20 is a good range to find yourself in between. Yeah. I think that um, for a lot of people, like, I know that there's always like a few people every year that I hear about from my friends who end up applying to like a really large number of schools, like 40 or 50. Um, and I think the major takeaway with that is that you only have so much time to write your secondaries because they're all going to really come at once. And so another way to think about the number of schools you apply to is that you only want to apply to as many schools where you can reasonably write the secondaries and be happy with them. Because if you end up turning out a bunch of okay secondaries that you're not the most proud of, you'll probably end up getting similar results in terms of numbers as if you turned out a smaller amount of really higher quality secondaries. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk more about secondaries in an upcoming video where we're gonna dive into um, secondaries, pre-writing secondaries and how to approach that process. So we're gonna move forward to think about what kind of things should we be looking at when trying to assemble our list of programs? So the first thing that is always immediate is the research interest and how well a program or an institution have um, faculty and research programs that align with your research interests. Um, common sources to consult for this is grant to me It's a site that um, nicely compiles NIH grant funding and make it, making it um, easily, easily searchable as well as you can go directly through NIH reports to um, a different interface for the same kind of data, um, as well as obviously consulting programs, um, websites and their faculty affiliated with the program. Yeah. Um, and this is especially important if you're applying to a PhD program that is a little bit non-traditional. Um, so that could be whether you're a social sciences applicant, which has a much smaller amount of schools that do offer MD PhDs and something like anthropology, or even whether you're doing a field like, like I did bioinformatics, which some schools have really strong PhD programs for, but other ones don't really yet have the infrastructure to support um, a lot of PhD students in that area. Yeah. Um, the next thing that you should think about um, is the environment. So 
Of course, it's important to find a school where you're going to find research that you like, where you'll be able to have strong clinical training, but also this is a school that you're going to be at for probably like eight years, if not a little bit more. So you want to make sure that the wherever you're going to go is someplace that you're actually happy living with. So this kind of factors into a lot of things. Um, the first one is cost of living. Um, as an MD-PhD student, you will get a stipend, so that makes things a little bit easier than if you had to take out a lot of loans. But at the same time, you do want to think about where you'll be able to live, kind of whatever lifestyle that you want comfortably. So if you're someone who knows that you love going out to eat, you love going out to bars and going out a lot, then maybe going to a really big city where the cost of living is really expensive won't be the better fit. Um, this could also be if you're someone who is wanting to start a family or knows that they're going to have other financial obligations come up throughout the eight years you're doing md PhD training. That's also something that you want to factor into figuring out where you actually want to go. Um, but beyond that and all the kind of annoying money thing to think about, you also just want to think about what you'll actually be able to do in that city. Um, will you be able to find cool stuff to do on the weekend? Um, if you really like hiking, do you have easy access to that? If you want to be near your family, is it easy to get home? A lot of things like that might not seem that important right now where you're just thinking about all this professional development and career stuff, but ultimately you want to be somewhere where you know that you're going to be happy because no matter how great an MD-PhD program is, there are going to be times when you struggle or times where things won't be as easy as you once thought they would be, and it's really important that you have other stuff to kind of go back to in those moments. Yeah, I can't reiterate enough the importance of having an accessible support network. I think that's something that's really important to consider in relation to the geography or location of the school that of the programs that you're thinking about. Um, and along the same lines about having a supportive network is things that the program itself um, qualities or traits of the program that lends itself to a supportive environment um, for you. Um, that could be the science program. Do you feel better supported if there's a lot of students where you have a lot of peers to lend to lean in um, to lean on or, this, or do you prefer a smaller um, program um, where maybe you have more um, attention from administrators and support staff in the program? What, how are the admin of the program? Are they supportive? Are they hands-on, hands-off things? Um, some of these things are not obvious from places like the lab website, but there are definitely ways to um, reach out to current students, alumni, um, to ask these kind of questions as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, another thing to kind of think about along those lens is um, where do kind of alumni of the program usually end up at? Now for most MD-PhD students, that would probably be residency. So you might want to look a little bit farther than that and see if people tend to do a lot of academic medicine, if that's something you're interested in. You might see that a lot of people tend to go into industry, which could also be something really appealing to you. But whatever your career paths are right now, you just want to make sure that the school will be supportive of that because that's going to be really important in kind of launching you to the next step of your career. So on the note of program outcomes, a lot of schools will publish their match list each year, or you can find them on um, forums. So that's a piece or a source of data that could be um, consulted, as well as generally there are um, data tables published by AAMC that talk about how many, for example, how many students apply to a school, then how many students end up matriculating. It's not a perfect indicator of preparedness of the school, but it is a rough proxy to consider. Yeah, definitely. I think those are all really good sources of data to help you make an informed decision. Um, but with that said, we do recognize that while there are kind of sources of data, there's also like not as much information as you might expect. So for example, for MD admissions, like a lot of people talk about AMSAR, which is basically this like compiled database of a bunch of different schools with like average GPA and MCAT and a lot of other really useful information. But there's nothing really equivalent to that for MD PhD. Um, and I think that because of that, that can really feed into kind of uncertainty about knowing which schools to apply to. And like, of course, like you don't want to apply to too many schools as we already talked about. So I think there is a pressure that we all put it on ourselves to just be, you know, very pragmatic and realistic, which is good. Um, obviously, we want to go into our school list being realistic. But at the same time, you really don't want to underestimate the power of fit when you're thinking about schools. So for example, um, one of my friends who I met on the trail, 
was really interested in this one MD PhD program, but they were a little bit below the normal stats and they didn't really feel like they fit into the mold of a traditional accepted student to that school, but they just couldn't shake the fact that they really loved the school and they just felt like it would be a really good fit. So they ended up interviewing there and then they ended up getting accepted and now they're actually starting there in the fall. So I think it goes to show that um, like stats and like other kind of like numbers are, you know, part of the process. We can't completely disregard them. But at the same time, as we kind of said in our previous video, at the end of the day, the people who are going to be accepted to a program are the ones who program directors think will really just be able to make the most of the resources at that program and where that program will really facilitate their journey as a physician scientist. So again, even though it's really easy to kind of get into this mindset of like, am I good enough for this program, et cetera, et cetera, when making your school list, also recognize that it's not really a question of whether or not you're good enough, but rather whether or not you'd be a good fit for that program. And that goes both ways, both in terms of what the programs think about you, but also in terms of how you evaluate the program's research opportunities, um, the cohort size, and a bunch of the other things we, we just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing besides, for example, MCAT and GPA numbers, a lot of misconceptions swirl around the idea of publications. Um, I didn't have a publication. Maya didn't have a publication. We both ended up um, at programs that are great for us. And having a first author like Cell Nature Science paper is like non-deterministic. It's not going to guarantee you get in. It's um, to the program of your choice. And so it's one of those things that because there's a dearth of data, um, I think it allows misconceptions and preconceived notions to build upon itself and to create these like checklist D myths that don't really guarantee anything. Even if you have all the things on this quote unquote checklist, there's no guarantee. But also even if you don't have all the things on these checklists, there's still a good chance that you're competitive for many of these programs. So um, we wanted to dispel these myths that you have to have a publication to get in or you have to have great numbers um, to get into these programs. It's really like Maya said about articulating how you could fit with the program and how the program will allow you to further your career goals as a physician scientist. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such an important point that like often gets glossed over in MD PhD admissions. And actually um, I wanted to highlight the work of someone I've been seeing just doing like amazing stuff on science Twitter. So um, Bree Christophers is a MD PhD student at the Tri I program. So that's between Cornell, Rockefeller, and MSK in New York City. Um, but she created more Sloan Kettering. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, she created this um, hashtag on science Twitter called Diverse Double Docs, um, which basically is just meant to highlight the fact that there are so many different people and so many different paths to MD PhD training. And that even though there's often this kind of misconception that we've talked about, that MD PhD applicants, even compared to MD applicants, are like these like superstars and everything, perfect numbers, amazing publications, amazing extracurriculars. Um, that there's so many different like stories that people have and then they end up being amazing MD PhD students. And there's really just no single kind of ideal MD PhD student, but really what we have seen kind of anecdotally is that the people who tend to get into the programs that they really wanna be at are the ones who just are pursuing what they're really passionate about and like kind of chasing that interest, like whether it's something that's you know more usual or something that's more kind of unusual. Um, so that's, something really important to think about too, yeah. And she's written a nice commentary or small short article about how um, emission statistics um, are needed to better encourage diverse applicants to apply to MDPG programs um, in the Journal of Clinical Investigation um, out earlier this year. We'll link to that and then actually a number of articles thinking of uh, addressing or talking about um, encouraging diverse applicants to apply uh, down below. So um, we really encourage you to read those articles um, to think about and to realize how misconceptions are, uh, might be preventing um, qualified applicants to apply to competitive programs. Yeah, so I guess what we're trying to say is like, shoot your shot. Um, I don't know how Kenneth felt, but like definitely me going into the MDPhD application process, I didn't think it would pan out the way it did. And I think like I actually had a lot of encouragement which helped me kind of get to the spot where I am now where I'm going to a program which I, I really love and I'm really excited about. So like we encourage you to just like 
go apply to the programs where you feel like you'd be happy at do your research be informed but also like take this chance like really like make the most out of this opportunity so as always feel free to reach out to us on our twitter handles or contact us via email so next time we're going to be covering primary so looking forward to seeing you there